One of the problems with the investment industry, I think, is that it is possibly, and I've been in it for 30 years, so I have some, some right to say this, uh, it's possibly the worst managed industry that I've ever come across in, uh, in my experience. And I think that is important to remember. What happens in most investment management businesses is that you get a star fund manager or a star fund manager or two or three star fund managers. And the drive within the business is then to try to give those, those star fund managers some form of career progression. And that usually ends up with that star fund manager running the business. So we tend in investment management to always over promote people who are actually good at one thing, which is managing money. They're not necessarily very good at running people or defining strategy or turning businesses around. And so time out of time, you get, you get fund managers in charge of asset management businesses. And I often wonder what, what the asset management world would look like if we took someone who'd run a successful supermarket chain, for instance, or a, uh, a successful industrial manufacturing business and put them in charge of a fund management business. You, you say that to CEOs in asset management companies and they'll tell you one thing. You don't understand, Paul, they'll say fund management businesses are very different to running a supermarket or to running an, uh, an industrial concern. They're people businesses. They're all about talent. It's not measurable. All of these things get trotted out and I've heard them um, so many times in my career. But ultimately, a fund management business is, in my view, no different to any other business. There's manufacturing inputs and outputs. Uh, there's marketing, there's sales, uh, there's HR, there's IT. They're the same things that you would see in any business under the sun. Uh, and if we, if we were a better managed business, we wouldn't be in the mess uh, that we are in today, basically. And I'll come back to that. But these, this is a PW survey. Um, which, which I think sort of underpins the, uh, a little bit about uh, asset managers. Remember, an asset manager is a professional optimist. So that's what, that's what fund managers do for a living. So it's not surprising that 97% of them are confident about their revenue prospects in three years' time. However, having said that, um, the 80% say that regulation uh, is a threat to growth, and 37% think that um, customer trust, um, uh, only 37% believe that customer trust has improved over the last few years. So, uh, you know, that slide shows the mix of good and bad. Now, a fund manager, as I say, professional optimists, they focus on the fact that their revenue is going to increase over, over the next three years. They don't really focus so much upon the, um, the headwinds um, that they're going to be, face, uh, be facing going forward. So lack of trust is the first theme that I wanted to talk to today. And that 37% number that I just showed you uh, is, is the one to focus on. Um, it's disheartening, really, to see that only uh, a third of CEOs surveys see positive change in the level of trust. Um, but we're not particularly surprised to see that. This is a, a slightly uh, difficult graphic to see. But essentially, it's a survey that we did with the Edelman Trust people or the Edelman PR people. It's called the Edelman Trust Survey, in conjunction with the CFA. Uh, we asked a whole uh, series of investors in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia, and Hong Kong, um, basically, do you trust investment management firms to do what is right? And I think there's a couple of interesting things. But overall, um, retail investors, obviously, uh, with what's called relatively low intensity, i.e. only 13% of retail investors really trusted their investors a great deal, 51% in total trust. Um, but Hong Kong, you can see, um, actually 68% of our retail investors trust their investment advisor. Uh, I mean, I find that an extraordinary result and don't really know what to make of it, given sort of Lehman mini bonds uh, struggles and things of that nature. I think it's indicative of the fact that most retail investors in Hong Kong are fairly poorly uh, financially educated, um, not very literate. Um, perhaps um, place a very high relationship value on, on the people who are advising them rather than the actual content of that advice. But um, it's, a, it's an extremely high number for Hong Kong. And out of all proportion, as you can see, to the more developed markets, uh, the US and, and the UK, um, which I would have said had no greater or no, uh, no more um, uh, retail mis-selling than we, than we have here. 
So, um, but it is still, you know, a disappointing number uh, this far after the financial crisis to still see that only 51% uh, of retail investors and barely more of institutional investors, in fact, um, uh, uh, trust the industry. And what does that, what does that mean, really? Um, the cost of failures of trust uh, are really um, uh, quite deep. Um, uh, I was I was at a um, uh, a meeting earlier on today with one of um, one of the big insurance companies here, and they were they were giving me their 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 numbers on Asia in general, and I think this this is in, important. You know, Asian savers basically are highly liquid in terms of the way that they save, and part of that is due to this lack of trust that they have in their financial advisors and in financial products in general. And the thesis here is that this is building into uh, essentially a savings gap, that Asia is um, aging fast, as we all know, in all countries in Asia, possibly with the exception of, of places like Vietnam and the Philippines. But everywhere else in Asia, our demographics are, are worsening. And yet our propensity to save for the long term uh, is, uh, is actually just not there. And, and they, they gave me, this was a Manulife, and I know there are a couple of people in, in the audience from Manulife today. Um, Manulife have a, have a survey that they do called Aging Asia. And they were giving me a couple of stats this morning from that that I thought were, were really quite interesting. That, that as measured by the percentage of our savings in relation to our income, uh, Asia actually is, is reasonably wealthy. Taiwan, for instance, has four and a half times the savings, each household has four and a half times its average income in savings at any one, financial savings at any one point in time. The US ratio is about three, in fact. Um, however, um, of that, 60% of those savings are actually in cash, and only 4% of their income in any year is actually derived off their financial savings. Whereas in the US, I think it's, it's well into double digits. So the point being that we're not, in Asia, we don't mobilize our savings. Uh, we leave them in cash at a time when our populations are aging. So this is not, uh, this is not a good mix in terms of, of, of the future. Not only that, but the 5% that we do invest into mutual funds, um, of that, that is almost 100% intermediated. I, Asians don't do it themselves. They, for the, for the small amount of their assets that they actually do invest in mutual funds, they're intermedi intermediated through the banks. And as you can see, the banks are a winner throughout this. 60% of our savings go into deposits, and there's only one winner as far as that is concerned, and that's the banks. And then 90% of everything that we then do have um, our discretion over is also advised by the banks. So we have a very, uh, a very malfunctioning financial system from that perspective in terms of uh, how we want to deploy our long-term savings, basically. And you see this um, uh, all over the region. Australia, for instance, has just raised its, its uh, retirement age to 70. And I believe between now and 2022, uh, its, uh, its contribution rate uh, into the pension scheme from 9.25% to around 12%. Um, China obviously has, has introduced the one-child policy. Um, in Japan, um, a recent survey showed that around two-thirds of Japanese aged between the ages of 35 and 64 are concerned that they will not have enough money to last through to retirement. The US, too, uh, is grappling with this uh, problem. And one of our great icons in the CFA uh, is an American gentleman called Charlie Ellis, who's the chairman of the Whitehead Institute at MIT. Um, who wrote in last month's Financial Analyst Journal, and for those of you misfortunate enough to be a CFA, you all that clunks onto your mat um, every uh, two or three months. And uh, I don't know if you're like me, I, it takes me about four months to get up the courage to actually open it because it's uh, such, a, such a weighty tome. But anyway, he wrote in last, uh, last month's Financial Analyst Journal that financially we are like boys and girls, proud of their dark suntans without realizing that in 40 to 50 years' time, they will be patients of dermatologists checking for melanomas, basically. So, uh, um, so uh, that's his view 
uh, of how this retirement gap is going to hurt us. And one of the goals of the asset management industry is obviously to help the public grow their, their money for retirement needs. Um, at CFA Institute, as I said, um, trust uh, is, uh, is a key factor. Restoring that trust is a key factor. Um, and this is another slide from the survey. And I think what, what's important here is, is that um, the actions that we need to do to restore trust, as, as uh, told to us by investors, uh, only the fourth one is actually about financial return. The first three are all, are all about business values, the way that you actually conduct your business. Uh, transparency, um, responsibility, uh, the ability to address issues, ethical business practices are, are actually more important to most investors than financial return. And I think that is, um, that is important um, for us to remember. Um, sorry to bore you with surveys today, but we did another one uh, which was with the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, who did this thing last year for us. Um, and so th this is some good news. 67% um, of firms um, have actually said that they are uh, uh, raising the awareness of, of, of ethical conduct by their employees, uh, and 63% um, uh, strengthened their formal code of conduct. Um, the 67%, they also linked that in to... Um, uh, bonus and incentive structures as well. Um, I do a, a series of lunches every, uh, every month with the SFC here and with CEOs from the asset management industry. And we, and we talk about this um, a lot because it, it, it is important. The incentive structure of the industry is changing. But at the moment, the incentives around good behavior are what we would call negative incentives. And we, we, we talk at these workshops a lot about that in that uh, people will get their bonus money removed from them if they do not display the right types of behaviors, of right types of ethical behaviors. But at this stage, we fail to identify businesses that actually reward people who um, uh, behave properly, because it's much harder to, to measure that. How do, you, how do you measure whether someone has actually lived up to the highest ethical standards or has gone the extra mile uh, as far as changing the behavior of their, of their company is concerned. So at the moment, the incentivization is still negative. What we're looking for in this is, is to find businesses that are actively seeking to compensate uh, their staff um, for good behavior. Um, not on this slide, but there was another piece um, that was buried within this that was slightly more depressing. 50% of, of the CEOs that were um, surveyed actually also said that if they were to live up to the new standards of ethical conduct that their companies were proposing, 50% of them said that they felt that that would have negative uh, career impact on them. So that's quite a, a startling number uh, as well. And I think the other thing, um, the other thing to remember around this is that um, um, you know, we do, we do try and have whistleblowing regimes. We have one within the CFA. In fact, if you wish to maintain your charter, uh, you have to you have an obligation um, to call out bad behaviour. And the SEC in the US now financially incentivizes people to do that as well. But you know, whistleblowers still it's a, it's a very unfortunate term. I wish we could think of something better because it has such negative connotations uh, as as a phrase in English. But you know, so many whistleblowers, as soon as they've blown the whistle, are forced to move on. It's a bit like sexual harassment in the workplace. It's the victim who ends up um, being moved on, having to move job, et cetera. And, and that's the case, too, with whistleblowers. So we haven't really changed the culture of organizations to enable whistleblowing, or, or whatever nicer phrase we can come up with, to be, to be part of the expected behaviors, the behaviors that are actually um, uh, lauded by, uh, by businesses.